The heart has four valves and the tricuspid valve is one of the valves on the right side of the heart. Uh, tricuspid regurgitation occurs when the valve doesn't close properly, allowing blood to flow backwards instead of moving forward as it should. And this is because the leaflets don't meet in the middle, creating a leak. The most common symptoms of tricuspid regurgitation are breathlessness and fluid retention. So breathlessness uh, for most people means feeling short of breath on exertion, so they might be okay on the flat but struggle on an incline. Some patients are even limited on the flat. For other patients it may not feel like overt breathlessness but they may find that they're reducing their activity to avoid symptoms um, without realising that they're compensating for, for what are really quite debilitating symptoms. The other main symptom is fluid retention, and that often manifests as swollen ankles, but it can also be a, a swollen abdomen, a feeling of fullness or congestion, and also weight gain due to a buildup of fluid. Uh, for other people, the symptoms are less easy to describe, and it, the, the most common other symptom that people mention is fatigue, so feeling more worn out than you would expect to. Quite a good way of thinking about it is thinking about how you are now compared with how you were a year ago and thinking how that's changed. In most cases, tricuspid regurgitation is not a problem with the valve itself, it's a problem with the heart. So the heart has become enlarged and that stretches the valve so that the valve leaflets no longer meet in the middle. Uh, and that's what causes tricuspid regurgitation. That phenomenon can be worsened by long-standing atrial fibrillation, which is a, a very common irregular heart rhythm. For some patients, tricuspid regurgitation is primary, that is less common, and that's primary means that there's an issue with the valve leaflets themselves. The most common cause of that is a pacemaker issue. So pacemaker leads have to cross the tricuspid valve in most patients, and in crossing the valve, they can pin the valve open. Uh, the other issue is structural damage to the valve. Uh, so the valve is made up of leaflets and cords, and if any of those become damaged, that can also cause tricuspid regurgitation. Tricuspid regurgitation is usually diagnosed uh, by recognising symptoms such as breathlessness and fluid retention. Another sign that patients often comment on, and, and doctors may see as well, is prominent pulsatile veins in the neck. Um, the mainstay for diagnosis of tricuspid regurgitation is an echocardiogram, so that's an ultrasound scan of the heart, and that allows us to see tricuspid regurgitation, understand the mechanism of it, and also measure the severity. Until quite recently, the treatment options for tricuspid regurgitation were quite limited uh, and predominantly focused on medication. And the medication we use are diuretics. So diuretics are water tablets that help reduce fluid retention, but they can be difficult to take in high doses for long periods of time as they lead to you having to go to the bathroom very frequently, make you feel quite dehydrated, and they're just not very pleasant to take in the longer term. They can also worsen pre-existing kidney issues. The other option for some patients is open heart surgery, but for, for many patients, the risks of surgery are quite significant, particularly where patients have multiple other medical problems or are at the older end of the spectrum. My area of expertise is minimally invasive or transcatheter treatments for tricuspid regurgitation, and they include transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair, or TIA, where a clip device is delivered through a vein in the leg to bring the leaking valve leaflets together and reduce the leak. The other option we now have is transcatheter tricuspid valve replacement, where we put a new tricuspid valve inside the existing valve to take over the work of the valve. Uh, and we also do that through one of the veins in the leg. Both of those procedures are safe. They take around an hour and they only take a short hospital stay, usually a day or two. And patients experience a rapid improvement in breathlessness and fluid retention with minimal recovery time.